Thank you, Robert. I'm glad to be here. And co fefe to you. <laughs> you don't know what that means. You haven't watched the news the last couple of days, but it's a new word. The break, find out what it means. I think it has something to do with coverage. I think coverage is very applicable. Workers' compensation. We're always having to determine coverage issues. Yeah, if, you, if you tweet it, no. <laughs> Um, this is a great conference. I always look forward to being invited. And thank you, Robert, for inviting me to come and speak because I get to see some faces that I recognize. I see some familiar faces and I see some new faces as well. So it's good to see. Not a bad way to spend an afternoon. Get all your uh, education credits in and uh, mar margarita hour after. Right. Are those to go or are they work hard? hard. Yeah. Very, very, very good. I thought. Um, I thought I would do something just a little bit different to start out with and tell a little bit of a, of a story, like of a history story about workers' compensation. I think it's very important because it's your career. All of you have a job in workers' compensation and it's a, a story that not a lot of people have heard. Some of you will have heard it and be familiar with what I'm going to talk about. And some, some of it is kind of new uh, to you, but it's very relevant and I'll put it into context uh, to our workers' compensation system that we have today. But it was one early spring day, March 25, in New York City. And a young lady, 31 years old, was having tea, afternoon tea, on a Saturday afternoon with her friends. And about 4.45 in the afternoon, a fire alarm went off across the street. And then there were lots of alarms. And there were fire personnel, firefighters responding to a fire. And then there were yells. And there were screams. It was March 25, 1911. And the young 31-year-old lady was Frances Perkins. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And the fire was the shirtwaist triangle factory fire in New York City. And there were about 500 people that worked at this particular uh, location. And most were all ladies, a few men, and they were making a shirtwaist blouse that was the fad of the day, the style that all the ladies were wearing at the day. And this is what they were making in this factory. Um, and this fire starts out, and I mentioned 4.45 on a Saturday afternoon. 1911, most of these young ladies were teenagers. They're some in their mid-teens, late teens. Mostly recent immigrants from Europe were working 10-hour days, six days a week. And the fire, and this is a picture before the fire, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, and you'll see some little uh, bins on the floor, some baskets. And the fire marshal, after the fire and investigation, I thought that the fire might have started from a discarded cigarette butt or a match into one of those bins, which contained cotton scraps and the little paper that material patterns are made out of, which were also hanging uh, from the ceiling. Very, very flammable. Everything in the floor, on the floor, it was very, very flammable. Everything in the room was flammable as well. Another another floor, another part of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. You see all the little scraps of cloth, they're all, all cotton, very, very flammable. And this is the building. And this building is still located there in New York City. It's called the Brown Building. It's part of New York University today. And the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on those top three floors. It's a 10-story building. So they were on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor of this building. The fire started on the 8th floor. And there were 500 people working between the three floors. And before it was over, 146 people were killed. And the whole thing was over in 30 minutes. It's like a flash fire. It caught fire and it just consumed everything on that eighth floor and then the ninth and then the tenth. Many of the employees died from, from smoke inhalation, but some 
died from the actual fire being burned alive. 58 people died from jumping out the windows of the ninth and 10th floor of the building. Another 36 people died jumping down the elevator shafts that went to the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor. In 1911, there were really no building inspections, no codes. Three of the four elevators were out of order. Piles of bodies were found at the two exit doors that were on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor because they were locked. Chain locked to keep the employees in those rooms where the factory was. The owners, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, were afraid that their employees might steal one of the shirts that they were making. They might open one of the doors and slip one to somebody else on the outside, or that they might actually leave work early, or they might actually go outside one of those doors outside to take a smoke break. So those doors were all chain locked, and after the fire, numerous of the 146 bodies were found piled up at those doors. Another this is a picture of the back of the building. Those are the windows people were jumping out of that 10th and 9th floor. And you'll see right in the middle uh, what is a fire escape on the back of the building. And this next picture will zoom in on that just a little bit. But it was reported that it was a very uh, flimsy iron fire escape, poorly anchored to the side of the building. 20 people were on it when it collapsed, all 20 fell to the bottom sidewalk below and were killed and were found there. With no sprinkler system in the building at all. In fact, the owners of the building had did not want a sprinkler system in the building because they had intentionally burned their factories in 1902, 1907, and 1910 during financial difficulties to collect the fire insurance print, the policy limits that they had on their buildings at the time. Now, this fire was not intentionally set, but was an accidental fire. So the next few pictures are, are a little, little graphic, at least certainly for the day. But this is outside of the sidewalk, and those are the bodies that were found after people jumped, and some of the people jumped were actually on fire when they jumped. Others jumped ahead and actually being caught on fire. So 146 people died that day and to set up a makeshift morgue. They had a terrible time identifying all the bodies. In fact, they identified about 20 names that were involved in fire just uh, about 10 years ago, the last 10 victims of the fire. And that's the inside of the building room that we saw earlier in the picture. There's just nothing left. It was just consumed. And, and remember, I said it was all over in about 30 minutes. So it was a tremendous flash fire. Now, the lady that I mentioned that saw this is what's relevant to workers' compensation today. It's Frances Perkins. She was 31 years old at that time, but she went on to be the first female uh, cabinet member of the U.S. Cabinet of the U.S. President in 1932 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected President of the United States. And she became the United States Secretary of Labor. And Frances Perkins was she either established or was instrumental in, in, in more things, it's hard to imagine what all this lady accomplished. And she said that this fire was the motivating factor for starting the New Deal that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, started when he became president. You know, he was elected to four consecutive terms as president, and Francis Perkins was only one of two cabinet members that stayed 
in, in, uh, as a cabinet member for the entire time that President Roosevelt uh, was president of the United States. Francis Perkins started safety regulations for buildings, factory investigations. She reduced the work week for women from what was a typically 60 hour plus work week to 48 hours. She ended the child labor abuse practices that were going on. She established unemployment insurance laws, minimum wage laws, and in 1935, Francis Perkins is the one that drafted and authored the Social Security Act. So you all have that Social Security deduction made uh, as part of your payroll tax. And we all know what Social Security is, and that's all because of Francis Perkins. And so much of what influenced her was being an eyewitness to this particular fire. And a little side note to this story is the fact that the owners, they were charged with first and second degree homicide. And they went to trial, but they were acquitted. And when you think about it back then, 1911, the makeup of the jury was much more of their peers than it was of the victim's peers. But they were allowed to file a civil lawsuit against the owners. There was no workers' compensation exclusive remedy at that time, which we'll be talking about later in this seminar. But there again, the verdict was uh, against the owners. And so the, the plaintiffs as, as a whole received a verdict in compensation in the amount of $75 per victim. The owners ended up recovered fully from their insurance policy, and they actually recovered in excess of $400 per victim on top of all their losses for their property and their buildings. So it was a little ironic story there. But this fire caused outrage in, in New York City, in the state of New York, led to their workers' compensation laws, spread really across the nation. There were a few states talking about workers' compensation and it implemented some workers' compensation laws uh, prior to 1911, but between 1911 and 1920, when Georgia enacted our workers' compensation law, most of the states that were states at that time enacted workers' compensation laws, all as a result of the work of Frances Perkins and as a result of her being in that particular place at that moment in time and being so impacted indelibly upon her mind and her spirit revolving what she saw at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory that day. So I wanted to share that story with you because it's very, very relevant to, to why you are here in this room today, because that's really sort of the, the birth of a, the seminal event that can encapsulate why workers' compensation is what it is today. Of course, it's evolved over the many years since then. And so we have our 100th anniversary coming up in three years in Georgia, our Workers' Compensation Act, which will be in uh, 2020. And we'll talk more about that then. So I wanted to share that so that you would have some, some ideas, so that you are in, in the field and you have made your careers and you will work at your jobs in workers' compensation. Now I'm going to change gears now and talk just a little bit about uh, probably the most burning issue that we're getting at the board and have been getting for the last two years. Maybe really even longer than that, but hot and heavy the last two years. And something new that we're going to be doing and it's going to directly impact each and every one of you in this room because we're going to come up with a new process and we'll be involved in this process in one way or the other. And it has to do with handling the topic of medical treatment delays on compensable workers' compensation cases that we're seeing in the system. You know, the state board kind of sits at the center of our workers' compensation system. You're involved. A lot of you are handling claims on a day-to-day -day basis. I look in the back of the room and you see there's all these different vendors that are here, and some are on behalf of the medical providers, uh, some on behalf of other um, uh, type of medical services. And then we hear from uh, third-party administrators and direct insurance companies. We 
hear from the medical community, the medical providers. We certainly we hear from uh, on behalf of injured employees, typically through the claimant attorney organizations. We hear from the different stakeholders. And we're hearing it from our uh, nurse case managers because we in, uh, increased that role in the new board rule 2.2 uh, a year and a half ago. So I think we may have some nurse case managers in the role, uh, in the room, playing that role. And we're getting complaints that have been that the scenario is a compensable worker's compensation claim is being handled. And the injured employee has a compensable injury and a compensable body part for which they're receiving treatment. And there's an authorized treating physician, an ATP. The authorized treating physician may be the actual panel physician. It may be somebody that the parties have agreed upon to let that person be the designated authorized treating physician. The treatment is sort of going along okay, and then there comes a delay. It's like the claim just sort of comes to a stop because that authorized treating physician has recommended Maybe it's a repeat MRI test or some other diagnostic test or it's recommended we need to try physical therapy or we need to continue physical therapy or we need to try this type of prescription or maybe it's time for the surgery. Maybe the surgery had been talked about early on but let's try some conservative treatment options before we get to that point. Now it's time for surgery. And then what well, the common business practice model as you know, of the treating physicians is that they want pre-authorization before they continue. They want, they want to hear from you. They want to hear that that treatment is going to be authorized, that surgery is going to be authorized, or they want to know that it's going to be denied, controverted. The problem that we've been hearing at the board is that neither one of those two is happening for an extended period of time. Weeks turn into months, months and months turn into a year. And the treatment recommended in that workers' compensation claim as part of this entire workers' compensation system, as part of the exclusive remedy, as part of the grand bargain, multi-facets to that, part of that medical treatment that's offered to that injured employee, they're not receiving it. They're not receiving it timely. And so we have been under tremendous pressures from various groups, and it has received attention. It's received some national attention from some of the data reporting services that there are some delays in the Georgia workers' compensation system in getting treatment provided. Now, I'm not talking about every case because, to your credit, what we know is that 87% of the cases are going very, very smoothly through the system. It's about 13%, and that's the ones that we see at the board. We don't see the ones that are going smoothly. We see the ones that get hearings requested on them, motions filed on them. And many of those hearing requests and motions are over a medical treatment issue or delay. And remember, I said it's for compensable cases where there's a compensable condition and there is an identifiable authorized treating physician. It doesn't apply if there's a causation issue or it's a disputed claim. Those are all things that you have to always look at and investigate. But in response to this, this problem, the board will be rolling out just very, very soon, later uh, this summer, a new process whereby the injured employee or their representative, their legal representative, their attorney can file a petition for medical treatment. And if they attach a few of the pages of the medical records to show who the authorized treating physician is and what the treatment is that's been requested to be authorized, but it hasn't happened yet, a little timeline attached to that, then the board is going to sign that immediately to one of our hearing judges. And the hearing judge's office is going to be contacting you. They're going to make a phone call to schedule a conference call within five days, no more than ten days, to get the parties on the phone and to see what, what is the issue. Because if there's a legitimate issue, then that just needs to be voiced and heard as to whether that treatment in that compensable case needs to be authorized or it needs to be denied. But it can't stay sitting on the fence indefinitely. That is going to stop. And so we have to have some either moving forward or a decision made 
on those types of cases that fall in this category that seem to be fairly clear. But if you have a legitimate reason, you'll be able to articulate that. There's a reason why it won't have to authorize it because there's a question as to whether this is even related to the original injury or this is not part of the claim or this never was reported. And if there's some, some articulable reason, that will be a time to voice that. And then a question will arise as to, well, should this requested treatment actually be controverted or not? And so then the judge is going to issue an order to, to either direct that the treatment be authorized and that written authorization be provided to the requesting uh, authorized treatment provider or that it, uh, BC3 be, be filled out and filed for the controverting the treatment. Now, uh, I think a lot of the cases are probably going to get resolved somewhere prior to that conference call or on the conference call in that stage we get a decision will be made as to what to do. But uh, either side I'm happy with the judge's ruling can then request a hearing. We file a request for a hearing within 20 days. We want to have a full evidentiary hearing on that uh, medical treatment authorization issue. But that is uh, is coming very soon. And so I want to talk about that because that's going to have a direct impact on you. Uh, and you will see that come in. There'll be some changes to board rule uh, 205, the 205 form that many of you know about. It's never really worked all that well. That's a form that was designed to be used by authorized treating physicians to send in. A lot didn't want to use it. Some, some did. It just hasn't ever worked too good in the last 16 year history of it. And so something, something short of a major statutory change is what we're doing. Because there are groups that wanted a major statutory legislative change each of the last two legislative sessions and where there would be draconian penalties and assessed attorney fees on these types of cases. The board thinks because it's a serious, serious problem in those cases where it's a problem, but we think that the number is small enough that we can look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. We can get that judge involved on a case-by-case -case basis and, and hear from you on that case and then make a decision on that as to whether that needs to be authorized or controverted. So we're trying, we're going to try this procedure to see if this doesn't help with a very serious problem and what has been identified over the last two plus years. The other very serious, very, very serious problem that the board is addressing and is, is a huge problem. And this continues to be a problem. It's the over prescribing and the over utilization of opioid medication, the morphine derivative drugs, the oxycodones, the hydrocodones, the oxycontin, the purpose of the vitamins. Fortunately, national attention is on that issue red hot now. Uh, has been for the last year, two years. It's been the subject matter at the National Drug Conference last two years held just down the street here in Atlanta. President of the United States came and spoke. The new president of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, said that opioid crisis is the number one problem in the United States. Somebody in the audience being personally impacted by an opioid problem or uh, addiction or an overuse or at least some member of their family or some co-worker or somebody that they work with. Its tentacles have reached just about every person in the state of Georgia. 7.8 million opioid prescriptions were written in the state of Georgia in 2015 for a state of 10 out of 4 million people. Those prescription count, not pill count, prescription 30-day supply, 60-day supply, 90-day supply. We can't even count up the number of millions of opioid derivative pills that are out there that have been consumed, that are out there in the medicine cabinets. Teenagers are getting access to them. We hear about the drug overdose death rates almost daily now on our local news stations and our local newspapers. We are looking very hard. Our medical committee and the advisory council with the input of the medical doctors all agree and recognize that we have got to do something about the opioid problem. We're looking at an opioid drug formulary just for opioid drugs uh, to try to get a limit, try to get that uh, the, the over prescribing to get that to come down. When you see that issue in your case, I mean, it has to be addressed right on, on the bat. I mean, a first, a first prescription, I mean, if a first prescription is for a 30 day supply, that individual can be addicted within 30 days. I mean, some of the, the CDC here in Atlanta, there's 
some of the national physician groups have adopted the CDC prescribing guidelines which are no more than a seven day initial, uh, initial prescription for opioid because typically it should only be prescribed post-surgery. They have agreed essentially unanimously that opioids are not an effective use to treat long-term chronic pain. So our first goal is to try to limit future cases, accidents that happen today and going forward from getting addicted and all the opioids. We know we're going to have a problem with the legacy claims, all the claims that we have right now that you're handling when you got an opioid problem with opioid prescribing. Huge amount of the increase in cost on the medical side in the last few years, almost 20% of it is attributable to the opioid prescriptions, a very expensive element of the claim. But the cost, the impact on the injured employee, on the quality of life, for them, their family is huge. It's not the best method of treatment. The medical community is coming around that there are other ways to treat pain, long-term chronic pain, and certainly that the prescribing habits of the last 20 years have to be changed uh, due to the impact of the addiction rates of opioids. Uh, so.